see a whole Irish cinematic universe where there's actual more Irish people than just one. No, just... The, there's a baby Irish person. It's going to be the, the, the Italian men, and then the Russian man, and the German man, <laughs> the Dutchman. Ooh, the Dutchman. Does yeah. he fly? <laughs> Is yeah. that... I'm surprised that's when we step into superhero. <laughs> superhero flying Dutchman. Uh, not original, folks. Not original. Flying Dutchman versus the Scarlet Pimpernel. I didn't make sense of that somehow. Maybe that's the plot of the next Riddick movie. <laughs> no. If, well, I mean, Scarlet, maybe. The entire movie would just be bathed in digitized red for it because that looks cool. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's a limited color palette. It's kind of monochromatic. Not monochromatic, but it's like trending towards that. It looks like Mortal Kombat, some of those scenes. <laughs> Do you remember that when they're fighting in hell? Uh, Mortal Kombat had better uh, cinematography and lighting than oh. this movie. Well, that's probably a good transition, Max. <laughs> For this week's episode of The, the Spectator, Spectator Film, Film Podcast. Podcast. And what is the movie you just slighted? No, it's Pitch, Pitch Black. Black. I was about to say The Chronicles <laughs> of Riddick, but that's not the movie nope, we're doing today. Correct. That I might, uh, yeah. Oh, also, boy. to aspiring movie makers out there, if you're going to make a trilogy, you can't change the name of your trilogy <laughs> in the second movie. No, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> you can't just, I mean, if you want to do like a Dario Argento, like this is a spiritual trilogy. There's no like overarching characters throughout all of them, but they're no, like, they kind of are. They're kind of are, but it's more like the witches. Like it's like, it's not like the same hero and the same everything sort of, you can do like a spiritual trilogy, but you can't just be like, this is a, action trilogy starring the same guy throughout all of them and then like the first movie has a title that doesn't like have to do with the main character and then change it in the second one no i'm about that okay. i'm saying that i think their their approach and we'll talk about this more during the commentary track was more that they're trying to do a type of like space conan the barbarian character which i don't know if i've ever mentioned this on the show before but uh i'm quite familiar with conan the barbarian because, and who are uh, you by the way oh i'm austin and i'm max and i am not interested in space conan the barbarian <laughs> austin the barbarian um but no i i uh I took a class uh, but way back in college. And, um, in the olden times. And uh, for that class, I had to read literally every Conan the Barbarian thing ever. I'm not even kidding. And there was a lot of I it. Don't, I don't think that you'd be fucking with me about that. Yes. Uh, that is not a badge of honor. I don't know what it's a badge of. I just, I'm done with reading Conan. There are certain things I appreciate about it <laughs> and other things. I'm just like, you know what? I did that and I'm moving on, but it would be neat to see a type of character like a Zatoichi type of character. That's just like a space Vin Diesel who uh, wears <laughs> goggles and has like shiny eyes or whatever. And, uh, and uh, a heart of gold. Fun fact, do you know where the word barbarian comes from? What? Uh, the Romans, they thought all of the, because uh, we, it's a Latin word. Okay. Um, and like many words, they thought all of the Germanic tribesmen were like the Goths and the Visigoths and all of them. They thought their language just sounded like they were saying bar, 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 bar. So they're just <laughs> barbarians. <laughs> That's literally the level of intellect that what, they were. What do up. they call them? I don't know. They just fucking talk like idiots. <laughs> <laughs> they're bar, bar, room. That's like, it's like literally, you know, like the Jeff Dunham jokes of just like, I'm no. from Dirk Durkistan, like, or the fucking oh, yeah, Team well, America. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah. It's like that level of discourse. And it's just a word that we use now. Yep. Oh, the more humanity changes, the more it stays the same. <laughs> yes. That's Pax Romana. Bar, 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 bar. <laughs> Look at these idiots. But yes, <laughs> that's probably. Would the Romans have ever made something as stupid as this? Probably. But. <laughs> <laughs> This movie is not as terrible. Uh, I We should explain, too, that... Um, this was an accident. This was a horrible, horrible accident. <laughs> it's not the worst accident. It's not as bad an accident as accidentally getting hit by a like meteor and then <laughs> crashing on a random planet, Max. It's not that bad. True. But what happened this week was um, we were trying to decide on a movie and then uh, through some sort of horrible social miscue uh, between Max and myself... Somehow we chose pitch black, <laughs> but also both of us at the same time while we decided to do it, thought the other one had picked it. Yeah. Basically what happened is we were messaging back and forth and Austin apparently jokingly was just like, well, if you can't think of anything, we can always fall back on uh, the Riddick movies. 
or, and then he started going off on like, oh, well, or we could do this. I'm like, oh, so the Riddick thing is something that he actually wanted to do. And you know what? We've done stuff like Battlefield Earth and Event Horizon, just dumb genre movies before. And that's always been a fun well to go back to. So sure, Austin, I'll indulge, indulge you. Let's do Pitch Black. Well, the thing was, I suggested jokingly doing the Chronicles of Riddick. Yeah. Just because I'm like, well, that, that'll be a fucking fun thing to do, won't it? Um, and then you were like, you know what? We, we haven't done any like schlocky action genre things in a while. Let's do Pitch Black. And I'm like, oh, he chose Pitch Black. Because when people say the Chronicles of Riddick, I don't inherently think of the second movie. I just sort of think of the series <laughs> overall. Yeah. So anyways, that's how it happened. And then we just realized that literally 20 minutes ago when mm-hmm. we started talking. But that's okay. <laughs> uh, somehow the stars have aligned to Vin Diesel won't be denied, Max. Uh, you can't stop him. Yeah. Uh, listen, <laughs> we did not know who we were fucking messing with. That's what I'm going to say. So uh, Vin Diesel put a, cur- a hex on us, and this this is happening. Yeah, he's he's uh, probably a 12th level warlock. He probably Oh, can. that's right. He is, he's, isn't he? I, I don't know what class he plays. Because um, normally, like, when I want to be like, oh, well, if he's an action movie star, he probably wants to do something different. So maybe he's like a cleric or something, but no, he could just be a barbarian. Who knows? Vin Diesel's a big Dungeons and Dragon nerd for the two people out there that didn't know that. And I love, I kind of love that about him, but yeah, he does seem to be very like affable, yeah. sort of unpretentious or, you know, like standoffish person, which is obviously appreciated. Um, and also I think influences his like bizarre persona on screen, but we'll talk about that during the commentary track. Either way, that's just a long preface for saying that this movie's kind of like, okay. And it's kind of like, take it or leave it. I think I enjoy it more than Max as uh, <laughs> you don't need to think it. <laughs> it's very true. And Max will confirm that for me <laughs> shortly. Um, but I will take responsibility and say that this is my pick for this week. And um, yeah, I kind of enjoy this movie. I think it's very rough around the edges. But I think it's like, uh, do you know that meme of the farmer who's like, it's not much, but it's an honest day's work? Yeah. It's kind of like that. <laughs> That's what I think of this movie. It's like, you could take it or leave it, but they made a movie and they did some things. And I'm like, oh, okay, you did some things and there you go. But also um, revisiting it for this week, I noticed a few interesting details about it that I think don't really congeal into something that's cohesive and... Um, deliberate on a part of the movie, but there are interesting details nonetheless in terms of how it plays with genre. I think it's a really neat uh, genre mashup. It is uh, in some ways a remake of The Birds while also being a remake of The Flight of the Phoenix wrapped in sci-fi Western trappings, which is interesting. And uh, we can elaborate on that more in the commentary track, but uh, I think its strength is mostly in its premise and... uh, and it has some interesting performances in there, specifically with Rada Mitchell and then Vin Diesel being simultaneously boring, but also weirdly compelling in bizarre ways. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's a mostly harmless movie and it's just a straightforward take it or leave it sort of genre romp. Do you and wanna, that's totally okay. Do you want to explain your history with it before I talk about my opinions on it real my quick? history with it? Do you have a history with this movie? Do you want to explain? Oh, are you... Okay, I thought you were referencing something no. <laughs> specifically. I mean, I don't even remember when I saw this for the first time. Yo, same. Um, <laughs> okay, so my side. <laughs> yes, please continue. Um, I believe... Like, I, I know I've seen this and the Chronicles of Riddick in the past. Um, those movies had evaporated from my brain, probably for the better. Um, one of the reasons I agreed to do this is next to my super expansive collection of movies, my roommates have started putting the movies they own on my shelf I have in our communal living space. And a couple like weeks ago, I noticed I'm like, oh, my friend is pitch black. That's useful if... I ever need to do that. And then literally a week later, Austin was like pitch black. Oh no, you were like pitch black. I was like Chronicles of Riddick. Okay. Whatever you said, we'll leave that in the past. (laughs) But so I booted this movie up and the first thing that I remembered (laughs) is, wow, I don't like this movie. Um, this movie is ugly. (laughs) It gives me a physical headache to look at if the lights are on while I'm watching it. It was like Humpty Dumpty when we did the... Oh, it was like uh, Scanners. Yeah. had to clean up after Max's brain and put it it back inside. It's physically painful to look at for me. That's 
especially the first half of the movie. I get what they think they're going for, but it's very badly executed and super ugly. It is pretty garish. Um, as far as characters in this movie, it doesn't take me long because there are none. Most 90% of the cast is meat for the meat grinder. So the movie never feels compelled to develop them. So I care about when they get torn apart by evil monsters. Vin Diesel, I describe his effect as sort of a black hole where there's nothing there, but you're inherently drawn to him. You're just, whenever he's there, you focus is voomp to him, but there's not much there. I don't hate him as an actor or as a person. And I think he can be slightly charming. And some of the one liners he delivers in this are endearing. I don't think it's enough to carry the movie. No, he doesn't carry it for sure. And listen, Keith David's in this. And I love myself. Keith David, he's very charming and enjoyable. And it's a, smooth velvety voice that warms me over whenever I hear it. But, but (laughs) (laughs) he's also cast in this movie, which means his one trait is a man. (laughs) He's a mom. His name is a mom. His his job is a man. No, 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 Max. The job is a mom. And they refer to him as a mom. I've, I've, I don't know what the fucking deal with that is. I don't know if that's a norm. I'm, I don't know enough about Islam. He's a Muslim. To like, he's a Muslim ca- yeah, cleric, basically. But yes. still, like, and they only refer to him at, by his clerical title. But regardless <laughs> of that, it's his own thing. It's stupid. <laughs> yes, it is quite stupid. Nobody is developed besides, like, not even Riddick, but like we have drug addict cop and pilot who had half of her character arc cannibalized by Vin Diesel because they realized they needed to have him do something in the movie besides kill monsters. I really don't like this movie. I, it has the setup of a movie. I would like, I tend to like space Westerns. I tend to like sort of size five movies on less grand scales. And also to comment on a recent trend in sci-fi. I listen, I like the Martians interstellar Armageddon, like all like the fucking like high concept what if aliens are a different form of consciousness, like that kind yeah, of shit? Yeah, like a premise to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like high-minded sci-fi, but also, like, in modern sci-fi, like, outside of Star Wars, it's the only shit that we get now. Yeah. So I am kind of nostalgic for, like, small scale, like, just a... Genre spa- sci-fi, yeah, yeah. A spaceship and their crew on, not wacky adventures, but just, like, adventures or in a predicament or something like that. But- Some sort of premise... In a sci-fi thing. It's why thing. I, enjoy, yeah. like, if you go back to our Event Horizon episode, it's why I genuinely enjoyed that movie. Although I think that that movie is definitively better than this one. Yeah. Too. Yeah. But also, we're giving credit to Paul W.S. Anderson, so let's not dwell okay on that with too that. far. I don't have anything against him, really. Uh, I've been forced to watch every Resident Evil movie, so okay. you, you have a less, of, <laughs> less of a horse in this race than I do. Well, you should get revenge. Well, no, it was, I, I've mentioned this before, but I have an agreement with one of my friends that whenever a, this is kind of over now, because both these series have kind of ended, but whenever a new Resident Evil movie came out, he would drag me to see that. And then in a couple of months, a new Underworld movie would come out anyway, so I'd drag him to go see that. Um, so it was we were kept in constant balance. Although, I'm going to make another Resident Evil that's a continuation just to spite you. Well, that's the thing. There's already more Resident Evil movies than there are, under, are Underworld movies. So Wait we, a second. Didn't they finish it? Yeah, they finished both of them. Um, but they're doing more? I don't think so. Oh, I thought you just said they're making more Resident Evil movies. They said there's more Resident Evil movies than there are Underworld movies. Oh, okay. So you're already behind the eight ball on that <laughs> one. No. But yeah, I... Uh, but yeah, so this movie's ugly, has no characters, is very boring throughout most of it, and I'm not a fan. I don't like to sound like this. I really don't. I tend to try to, even, even like with movies that I don't like, I try to be like, oh, well, they tried with this, but like, there's not a lot here, folks. I'm, I'm not. Do you think it's more that you just did not enjoy watching it as much? You can, ad- you can acknowledge certain things no, that it does that like, you like in abstract, but you're like, I just don't enjoy the mixture of it and sitting down and watching it. It's not even that though, because there are a lot of movies where it can be like, oh, well, this wasn't that greatly executed, but I really like this theory and I really like, at like the idea of this. I like the creature. Like, I like their approach. I like the creature design for yeah. this stuff. This, it's like 
everything I like was slightly misstepped to the point where I can't even be like, oh, well, I like this, but they fucked it up. Mostly you can be like, I would have liked this. I would have liked this if, if they had done it in a different dot, dot, way. Dot. Yeah. But not to say it's like the worst movie ever made. Um, it, I would say it gets better in the second half uh, when they start stop fucking with the camera and like putting all these visual effects and weird lenses on it. Also, the second half is it's easier too because the the source of the drama changes yes. and it becomes more like they don't have to put any stress on an effects budget. They're just like, they have like CGI of course for the monsters, but it's more like also they don't have to have big set pieces. It could be just like, Oh, it's tense. Cause we're going outside now. Yeah. And yeah. it's, and it's dark. So the movie it's less <laughs> garishly bright. Yeah. Constantly. And it can be more interestingly lit at that point too. No, I, I'm with you on all that. The real problem of this is that, I don't think this movie is like good enough that it like really inspires me to defend it. And I think you dislike it just enough <laughs> to attack it. So we're going to end up in a situation where it, it'll probably seem like neither of us like this movie enough, or it might seem like I would like this movie way more. That's than what I I'm do. getting. <laughs> yeah. I was honestly startled that like you weren't going after it harder than I was during our pre-screening. But I do feel like this weird, like, paternalistic thing with movies like this where it's like it's just it's just like it's like a, it's already dead leave it alone or it's just like it's a like a kid learning how to write or you know what is a better example it's like a dog who like is like a dumbass and is like trying to figure out how to drink water and it's like oh you all right you can you're doing you're doing okay it's fine who's a good boy yeah <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about this movie in a lot of ways. So, um, yeah, there you go, folks. Uh, if so that doesn't get you hyped up for this movie commentary, <laughs> I don't know what will. But yeah. either way, if we're going to enjoy it, we've cursed ourselves to have to yeah. watch this there movie. There are some still interesting things I'm going to suggest and bring up throughout the commentary track. So I'm looking forward to that. But, uh, Max, do you think you're uh, you're all set? I'm going to pull this fucking airlock so I don't have to watch this movie and you can perish and die. Well, Max, I've got to say something. We can't begin without saying goodnight. Oh, boy. <sighs> Here we go, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, I had like a lot of energy going into this. And then as soon as the logo came up, I'm like, oh, we're watching the movie. Just pretend it's Jurassic Park, at least for the next three seconds. <laughs> oh, God, I guess you can't because the Universal logo tag has a website. Let's go to Universal.com to order our hot new DVDs that we can get sent in the mail to us. Yeah. Well, anyway. <laughs> Here's our middle of the road response to this movie, everyone. Exactly what we said it would be. Oh, no. I'm, I'm going to have to... I have to wait for the movie to start to before, like... Because I just don't want to... Yeah, repeat. take it easy. You know what? Okay. Max, this movie can't defend itself. It should be able to. Good movies can by just <laughs> merit of existing. Um, I like this spaceship prop. It's cute. I like it. I like when we have physical spaceships to establish things. It looks real. Yeah, it's a good 90s thing from yeah. this type of movie. There's a lot of cool things about this that are like just artifacts of 90s sci-fi movies that I enjoy. Well, yeah, because this was made in the far distant future of the year 2000. Yes. So truly a pinnacle of movie making time. Yeah, several years after uh, after New York was made a prison. Manhattan. <laughs> oh, I love the digital lens flare. That's so hilarious. <sighs> a lot of the effects in this have not aged too great, but that's totally okay. Were they even okay when they came out though? I'm like sure they were okay. As we talked about during the uh, prep screening, this is interesting because it seems like one of the first movies to be like a digital intermediate movie where for anyone who doesn't know back in the day, um, things in terms of like the way they would like do processing and stuff of colors in film. It was all with chemicals because they would shoot things on actual celluloid film and you would have to then bring that film to be developed. And then depending on the type of film you shot with or your camera or uh, how you developed it with the, whatever mixture of chemicals, it would maybe change the color of what came out the other end. Right. And uh, starting in the year 2000, specifically with the movie, Oh Brother, Where, Out Thou? Where, Where Art Thou?, directed by the Coen brothers, it changed. And what they would do is they would load up the film they shot 
onto what people called a digital intermediate, and they would edit the colors in a digital editing suite. And, um, and it looked great. It looks pretty good in Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Yeah. I, I don't know if this movie used a DI. It just really looks like one because they just look like they did a, like a blue filter over everything and then like a red filter. You know what I mean? And it looks like that's the way it was with like a few movies in the very first year of DI. And then Lord of the Rings came and uh, like many other areas of filmmaking technology innovated because they had to meet meet the the demands of this massive movie, right? So Lord of the Rings was using DI and stuff, but it did it in a more uh, conspicuously um, artful and balanced way. But yeah, so that's maybe part of the reason why (laughs) the movie looks so garish. Just so, if you're looking for an explanation. The scene is nice. We get like as much exposition on some of the characters as they'll get the entire movie. Yeah, he can smell, he smells the woman's... um, Boots and pants and tool belt, which made me revisit that uh, West Hills viral commercial. Have you ever seen that? No. I'll show you that after. It's great. And they're basically on a giant Greyhound bus going through space. Yeah. Oh, that's the other thing this movie is kind of a remake of is Midnight Run. Sort of. Why are you taking your prisoner back on a Greyhound bus? <laughs> <laughs> you know those things crash all the time. Can you imagine that? You just have like Dog the Bounty Hunter sit- sitting in the back of your Greyhound bus with a guy in chains. It's like, sorry, folks, I couldn't afford the armored van to take him back. So we're going to have to go. Going to have to take the MTA. <laughs> economy. Well, if it's MTA, then that's 100% crashing on the way, right? <laughs> this is what happens. That's just part of the... This, this ship is part of the MTA. Yeah, that makes actually. sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, uh, MTA jokes. They never get old, do they? Yeah, to all of you outside of the, <laughs> the tri-state the, area. Congratulations, you don't have the shittiest fucking train service in the U.S. Maybe there is one that that's worse, I don't know. I don't know, but for a major railroad that is supposed to go to the city 80 bajillion times a day, when you have a safety rating of a solid D, then maybe you need to... I think it was a D- minus actually last time. Maybe, maybe fucking... Could be worse. Step your game up. Technically. Well, if they fail, they get shut down. So no, it couldn't be. <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> this is what happens when we're kind of indifferent to the movie. And we see what are you talking crashing. about? I'm on the edge of my fucking seat. Uh, this right is now. okay. This movie was made for a but for a very modest budget. No, and they do a decent job. I like that. Like I said, I like the set. The set is great. It's a great spaceship interior of this chair moving around. We yeah. have all these things that look like they would actually be. It's great because they they really. I think Rada Mitchell here gives. I think her performance really holds the movie together. I think she's a really good actor. Oh, she's the protagonist of the movie, yes. despite the movie's protest. I mean. Regardless of the structure of the movie, she does give the best performance yeah. and the movie works because she's there. Um, if the movie can be said to work at all, it's because she's anchoring everything. And I think it begins immediately with her cell. I think her performance right now is actually why we buy this sequence of the ship crashing because she's the one who is having to like throw herself in this rocking chair against one side of the set to the other one and then like slam all these buttons and like twist these keys and everything in a very physical and demanding way to sell the reality of the situation. I think she's the reason why this scene works. I think we've talked about that with other movies too. You get a good actor to sort of like cover up the blemishes of like special effects or whatever. Cause if you buy what they're saying and what they're doing in that situation, you sort of just take it for granted that the rest of it is real too. That's why you got to get Ian McKellen to yell at that flashlight. Of course. And pretend it's a dragon. Uh, Now I'm sad. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. I'm sorry, Max. Max, just enjoy it. Just enjoy it. Like, no, I am enjoying this. Ah, I was going to say, cause this is before the movie starts to look like a dumpster fire, but then the, the dumpster fire <laughs> flared up in front of my face. For you know, a what, Max, you're just getting to know the interiority of the character of Riddick, who also wears goggles because things look like shit to him. Yeah, that's. Did you get a shine job? I'm surprised we haven't made a joke about that yet. Uh, <laughs> that's the best line in film history. But we'll mention that when it comes up. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I get that. I get we're going to have the super bright colors on the outside because if this movie supposedly is about Riddick, then we want the bright light to be as just sort of annoying and disorienting to us that we do as Riddick. A couple of problems with that. One, wow, what an effect. And let's just tilt the fucking image in frame and <laughs> make it look like we're crashing. Oh, you're talking about the fast. crash sequence? Yeah. yeah. That does not ever look good, really. Never do that in your movie. That. It looks super cheap and does not convey what you think it conveys. But... Anyway, sorry. About the color? Yeah, the color. That's something you do when, like, Riddick first, like, like he get frees himself and he goes outside and then we show the outside. So, like, the audience knows, like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's like you're... This the, is what it's like for The him. iris of your eyes adjusting yeah. to exposure. Yes. Or you're Jean-Luc Godard and you want to make your audience's eyes tear up and give them a headache because you think they're bourgeois fucks. But I, bougie fucks. I somehow don't think that was the goal of this movie. I am not going to say it wasn't. <laughs> I'm not going to say this movie wasn't. I want to give insert director's name credit here. <laughs> David Tui. Yeah. Yes. Known for such other films as The Fugitive. He wrote that. Okay. And he also um, directed a movie that I've never seen, but have heard some interesting things about set on a submarine. So you've got my attention there because I love submarine things. You love enclosed um, mechanical spaces movies. Those I are do. Your cup They're really tea. good. <laughs> They're really good, Max. Uh, and um, what else he's done? The Chronicles of Riddick, of course. And then he's done the whole saga, I believe. He, he did direct Riddick, the Riddick King. Yes. The Riddicking. That's like the quickening or something. <laughs> why wouldn't Vin Diesel just like, uh, I don't know. I know we need the action sequence here, but like, why wouldn't he just like hang up in the rafters there if he's already out? I don't know. Maybe he's tired. Or maybe he just thinks it's funny. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> That's an interesting thing about uh, Vin Diesel's persona that I'm going to elaborate on like a little bit later, but I feel like he is definitely uh, a little bit at odds with his character archetype that he's embodying uh, in ways that I find charming kind of. Um, but let me begin this opening sequence when we're, when we're um, pulling everyone out of the wreckage, I'll begin with my little like pet thesis for this movie that I developed. So I think this movie is mostly a, variation of the premise of the birds, right? Where the birds attack people for it's inexplicable. No one understands why. And the movie never makes any sort of attempt to, uh, understand why or find an answer as to why the birds are, have decided to, uh, unite against <laughs> the humans. And this movie is kind of like taking that premise and then rationalizing that inexplicable element of the birds using sci-fi trappings. So it's like, Oh, okay. So now it makes sense because it's the species that comes out at night and now the, you know, eclipse is happening. So they're coming out. That's why the irrationality of the birds attacking makes sense in this sci-fi premise. And then what it does is it's like, okay, so how do our characters get there? Oh, it's a flight of the Phoenix movie too. And then, okay, how, well, who are our characters? Oh, they're Western archetypes. We talked over it earlier, but then as they were, um, as Riddick was introducing the movie in his voiceover, uh, all the characters he talks about are sort of stock characters that you will also find in older Western movies. So this movie definitely relies on that type of um, uh, design for its characters and also just the landscape and the way uh, our, our narrative will be moving through it is very much a Western type of story where uh, those movies are very much related to themes of like wilderness versus civilization but also like the future of civilization, right? Written in microcosm on the interactions of our characters. Yeah. And then how that reflects on the future, right? That's why Westerns um, in their classical stage in film history are very much about like romanticizing and mythologizing Sorry, uh, mostly I'm, American history. I'm not exaggerating. I'm literally already getting a headache from looking at this movie. But you got to get those goggles, man. I know. I should have brought... I'm sure I still have. You should tweet at Vin Diesel, see if he's got some extra. I was going to say, I st probably still have some embarrassing yeah, cyber goth goggles somewhere deep in my closet. But um, 
<laughs> oh, you think you already had some already? Oh, I. Oh man, that have I not shown thing. you that picture of me from high school when I had bleach blonde hair and purple cyber goth goggles? Is it as bad as that compositing? Uh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think you should make that the uh, the uh, cover of this episode. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> I'll just Photoshop you onto like Vin Diesel's like ripped body <laughs> with a quote. He did not know who he was fucking with. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. Um, so we're introduced to our characters. Um, they're all thanking the captain or the temporary captain because they think she saved him despite her ready to fucking kill them all to save herself. The perceived captain. Yes. They think she's the captain. Mostly because she authoritatively saved them and they just assume she must be the one in charge, right? Except for John's. Yeah, but His shit. We have a uh, discount David Tennant, who I know David Tennant. I don't think had started his tenure on Doctor Who, which is really kind of what skyrocketed him into the public consciousness. But like, would have been much more charming to have him in this role. This guy's a little bit too old. Yeah, yeah. Um, and David Tennant was probably too young at the time. But yeah, he uh, was like a fetus. Come on now, <laughs> it wasn't a fetus, but <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it grows very quickly. But a more charming actor, especially like when you have people like Keith David as other side characters. I will agree with you that really the writing is so thin with some of these characters that if you had better actors in there, it would probably go a long way into fleshing them out and making them feel like, you know, they're a little bit more lived in <laughs> than they are otherwise. Or at least directing the actors you currently have yeah, to in a different way to really... Uh, get that out of them. Ooh, okay. As somebody who has dislocated one of their shoulders at least a dozen times, this scene is always just like, really, dude? <laughs> that looks like a digital effect, too. It is. Yeah. There's no, like, I mean, there's no fake way that you can... Oh, look, I dislocated my shoulder, but it's only for the camera. Yeah, no, that's 100% what that is. Um, and he's gotten away already. Because you can't stop Vin Diesel. You can't stop the Riddick. But yeah, I mother can't stop the Riddick. What? Dad can't stop me. Can't stop the funk. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Good. <laughs> Darn it. Oh, please just stay inside. Maybe, <laughs> maybe this movie is telling us that we're the real flying death monsters because we can't stand the light either. Ah, that too, Max. That too. It's really deep. So this is probably a good time to uh, further elaborate on my thesis. Because okay. again, as with much of this movie, uh, not much is going on <laughs> at this given moment. But I think um, the interesting thing with this movie is that it takes some of these archetypes and it just by contrasting the Western with the sci-fi, it, uh, it places them in a new and kind of interesting context, which is why I appreciate the premise. Okay, just give me w one second. You keep talking about your premise. I am going to get up and turn off the lights around. <laughs> oh, yes, quick. you should probably do that yeah. if it's going to keep you from, like, your head exploding because I don't want to clean that up again. Uh, but basically, what happens in this movie is it takes the Western and combines it with the sci-fi, as we have said. Now, the Western, as we were just talking about, is very much about mythologizing a certain sense of uh, America's historical past. And it is not the real historical past. It is, again, a specific vision of it, specifically how it relates to uh, society at the time in the 20th century. And uh, it's very much about, like, looking at the frontier space as, like, a land. It's freedom. Yeah, it's representative of manifest destiny. It's a space that allows you mobility, and agency, right? And also just agency in regards to your future. You can decide how you are going, how the society out West is going to behave because you're the one staking the claim, right? Yeah. Of course, this ignores the presence of Native Americans. That's its whole other conversation. But in terms of <laughs> no, how- No, it's not about what actually happened. It's about what it represents. Yes, exactly. That's, that's exactly the way to put it. And of course- when you take a sci-fi movie, at least this type of sci-fi movie, the space-faring sci-fi movie, in many ways it's the opposite of that, right? Where it is like a reverse of that and it's kind of like a mythologizing about the future. 
And both of them relate back to the present in their own specific ways. And the interesting thing about this movie and I guess a lot of sci-fi Westerns in general is the idea that you are actually combining them into one where it relates both to the past and to the future and then both of them together somehow connect to the present. And I think a really good uh, way of sort of examining this movie in that regard is just thinking about the Riddick character. Whereas I feel he is a variation on the Western, the Westerner gunslinger archetype. And I'm going to mention a uh, essay in the show notes written by uh, our good friend, Robert Warshaw, who wrote a uh, really great essay on the gangster film that we mentioned in our Scarface episode. And uh, I actually couldn't find it before this movie. So hopefully I don't like butcher his argument too much, Um, but I will try to find it for the show notes. But basically he compares the Western gunslinger hero with the criminal outlaw of the gangster and then sort of extrapolates insights into both genres from the difference between those two characters and specifically how those two characters relate to violence and their own desires. And um, I think Vin Diesel is very much, though he is a convict in this, more a representation of the gunslinger of the Western. And I think the movie plays with that in a kind of interesting way where this romanticized, rugged individualist in this future sci-fi context is criminalized. Very much for some of the things that would have made him a romanticized hero in a traditional Western. Yeah. (sighs) And definitely... Look at this blue. It is really blue. Like so blue. was this a stylistic choice? I, I mean, technically, yes. Or did they shoot this <laughs> and it looked really bad with all the CGI skeletons they put in? So they put a blue filter over it. And maybe. I mean, I don't know why that would make it better. It's a slightly cooler temperature. I mean, it's less jarring to look at. It's actually a warmer temperature, but also like... Um, I don't, yeah, I feel like the thing is with color like this, I'm not sure if CGI like composites into a frame fit better if you limit the colors. I'm not like a, a, like a CGI artist or anything. I know it makes sense with rain because that is like atmospheric disturbance that sort of adds layers and a sense of depth to a scene. So if you have something going on like that, it can maybe sell an like a CGI composition that you're putting into the frame a little bit better with a real space as well, because it looks like, Oh, they're actually in the same space together because there's rain on both of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I I think the color might help just because like when CGI things look fake, it's because like they don't really match everything in the background. They look like they're slightly sticking out. Yeah. That's what I'm talking about too. Yeah. So if everything's the same color, then it slightly hides that better. Or I mean, you like, reduce the color on both. Yeah. So it looks like it's more of a... That's possible, too. I don't know. All but I know is that they do motivate it with the story, so... They did build at least one skeleton set, because um, they use it now, and they come back to it later when they're running to the ship. Yeah. I mean, I, I this had a budget of, what, like around $5 million? Twenty. Oh. But for, like, 2000s, that's a little bit more than today, obviously, but it's still fairly... I mean, that's not even really like a mid-budget thing, even at that point in time. And it made twice its money back. Although, I have to be honest, I still think it's very bizarre that they greenlit the budget for Chronicles of Riddick. Yeah. Because that movie is so expensive. And it's like, well, you said it this was what, is a $20 million. $200 million? I, that was an exaggeration. No, it was, I believe it was $100 million when I looked it up. Really? It was like five times the budget for this movie. Yeah, and it's like, this movie succeeds because it's small and it's contained. You know? Yeah. And like, that is the strength of this movie. It, it has its premise and it does its thing and it doesn't really stay too long either. You know, it's not obnoxiously long. And we're, here we have a uh, Riddick being a hairstylist and teasing the back of her hair to give it better curls. Hair. Which I don't have. <laughs> what the fuck is that? Yeah. I don't really know the subtext of that. Like what, purpose of it is all i know is that i think the movie wants to establish riddick in a certain way and then sort of subvert your expectations um i think it wants you to associate him more with like a super violent criminal and then who's just fucking with them yeah and then reveal that he's more of a gentle 
Westerner gunslinger who's just very alienated. And maybe just going into this, knowing that like the next movie is called The Chronicles of Riddick, and the movie after that is called Riddick, like you never get a chance to that. But also he delivers the opening narration. Yeah, that's the thing. You never really get fully alienated from the Riddick character. But I, I'm okay with that too, you know? I mean, it's fine. But also like at the same time, If you, you kind of have to be like, you can't go too far. You can't have him like commit an atrocity at the beginning that we yeah. were there to see. I mean, it, it does sort of sweep the legs out from under certain moments in the film. Yeah. And maybe if they had made those moments a little bit more creative or were more committed to really exploring the Riddick character, that would have worked better. But I think their goals are just to make like, you know, a get in and get out genre movie, you know? And they're like, oh, well, so we'll do these interesting things along the way, but we're always subordinating everything to the pacing and the uh, structure of the movie, which is okay, too. It's just you have to pick and choose your battles. And yeah. sometimes it doesn't amount to as much as it, it feels like it should. And I feel like that's something with this movie. There's some awkward moments because it's, you get the impression certain things are building to more than they are or not quite to what actually winds up happening. But I do think... Um, building off that idea of the like dichotomy between the, the Western outlaw and the, or the Western gunslinger, I should say, and the gangster and both how they are different representations of masculinity, uh, sort of performing itself. Oh, and we'll get back to that later too. Masculinity. Yeah. I mean, that's all over this movie, but also like how they relate to violence, I think is very interesting. The difference where in the, in Warshaw writes about how like, the Western gunslinger is not really somebody who utilizes violence to achieve like specific goals. It is always, at least in the classical definition of a Western, it is always something that is turned to as almost like a last resort, right? It is how you enforce authority in the West, right? You use violence to validate your moral standpoint yeah. And, and sort of um, uh, consecrate your society over, <laughs> over the gangs and posses that are coming to harass you. However, it's not something that they use to accomplish goals. It's always in defense of some sort of morality or understanding of the world that they defend against antagonists, right? And uh, they do not do it to, I guess my point is they do not do it to like get something. They always do it in defense of something. You know? Yeah. I'll save my rant on the masculinity thing for later. But I guess, like, my problem with this early on in the structure is that we know Riddick's gone, but we don't really, like, have any reason to assume that he's stalking them. Because we know that he's not really going to be the same. But also, like, even vicious if we, killer they think he is. Even if we didn't know that, I, we would assume as somebody who went to all the effort of escaping that, like, he would try to be running away by now. But they are on an abandoned planet. Oh, it's this guy. <laughs> oh, he's dead now. They had to invent a new character for five seconds because they didn't want to kill off any of the ones they established. <laughs> I think it's more that they wanted to show, they wanted to implicate these characters more than Riddick himself. Oh, this is my favorite shot in the movie. Oh, there he is, everybody. Oh, there he is. It's the fucking Roadrunner. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I like that, though. I wish this movie leaned into that more because I think Vin Diesel is way more, like, funny than he is intimidating. Without really trying to be, by the way, I don't think if he... Uh, if he tried to jump the gap and work in comedies that that would, that would really uh, be quite as successful. But I think if you put him in an action movie and um, had him do funny things and didn't take his like action macho man character as seriously, I would enjoy that. Um, but yeah, that's probably why I like that moment a lot. The one thing I really don't understand about this movie though, is this moment where why, why are you, Digging in this hole. They what were, is the point of this? Well, they were burying all the bodies from the people who didn't survive the crash. Then why do you got to do that? It's deep enough already. Well, I think he heard that like open 
And now he's like, how did this hole get here? That's what I do every time I hear a noise on an alien planet. No, no. And now, uh, what was his name? Zeke? Yeah. The, the, the character who his only personality trait was saying he was an atheist when the Iman said something innocuous about believing in God. Um, no, now he's dead. Well, he's also a murderer. Well, only accidentally. It's manslaughter. <laughs> I Listen, I did intentionally kill him, but since it wasn't the person I wanted to kill, <laughs> Don't. not a murderer, not a murderer. Yeah, like well, I said, is. most characters are just meat for the meat grinder here, and it's pretty clear which ones are which. <laughs> also, like... If we want to establish Riddick as like this super powerful, like mega murderer, maybe don't have him get the shit beat out of him by like asshole cop twice in the first 15 minutes of the movie. Eh, they're establishing his weakness. I think that's important too, because again, related. But he lost even in like the closed and dark, you know, darkened corridor as well. Like, yeah, but he was cuffed. Eh. All I'm, all I'm saying is that I'm okay with that because that's part of his character as being the guy who is the, really the Westerner because the reason he has agency once they crash and wind up in the wilderness is the same reason that he has literally no agency in the beginning. It has to be one and the same. So he has to have no power when he is like, you know, wrapped up in a cryo chamber and within society. But once, once things break apart and they're out in the open in the wasteland, he's the one who has the most control and, and can do the most. But yeah, going back to what I was saying about him uh, being a Western outlaw versus the um, gangster, it it really does hinge on how they use violence. And uh, as we see, Johns will be more of an an example of the gangster, really, in this movie, where he uses violence. He does. There's no like emotional work being done or morality he's defending in his use of violence, mostly to contain Riddick. Um, and then threatened uses of violence against everyone else in their group. But there's no morality, there's no code, there's no nothing. He's just doing this as a way of trying to get money when he turns Riddick in, right? That's all it is. So the gangster doesn't do it as a way of asserting something larger than themselves, some belief in a code or morality. They do it primarily as an assertion of themselves. Well, that's the thing. Mostly financially. And that's why I think like, if we established like that Riddick wasn't going to be the main character earlier on, this movie would work better. Yeah. Because like possible. you sympathize with cop man earlier on because he was the one who stopped her from killing everybody on board by like jamming the airlock controls. No, that's not him. Yeah, it was. No, that's the co-pilot who dies. Gets the shit stabbed through him. I thought that was the captain who got the ship stabbed through him. I'm pretty sure it was the cop guy. The cop is not awake at the beginning. I couldn't tell the difference between the characters then. All right. Well, your eyes were already watering (laughs) by that point. So, but either way, um, much like, by the way, fun fact of Vin Diesel, because I read that the first day they applied those contacts, they kind of fucked it up. I think they scratched his cornea, which, damn, (laughs) that's painful, right? But yeah, continue with what you were saying. But like, you could moralize that and then like, Okay, even if it is a different character, which I would have to go back and rewatch the scene again. But you have that be the cop character, and then you find out that, like, oh, he didn't care about saving the people on there. He just didn't want Riddick to die because he gets twice the payment if Riddick is brought in alive. Yeah, sure. I mean, regardless, I think the movie does allow you to... to, uh, It does encourage you to, at first, have more sympathy for the cop than for Riddick, even though he does begin with the... Uh, narration. So, you know, there's more ambiguity there <laughs> than, you know, the most straightforward thing possible. And also it would make the end yeah, toward the end of the movie more tense when you have to know if you can trust Riddick because like you kind of know what's going to happen. Yeah. Just as a matter of the story, I think the performance in that moment is like kind of interesting in, in terms of just the way unintentionally, I think Vin Diesel sort of plays into that moment. Um, but I, I do think, agree with you when you say that you could really structure this story better to, if you are really trying to focus more on the ambiguity, but I don't really think this movie has a strong focus on its subtext. It, I don't think it really cares no, as much. I think it just it wants benefit, to, it could benefit from it is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, it would definitely be 
more memorable. It would definitely be better. But I think it still accomplishes a lot of the goals it's trying to because I think it's just trying to be like a straightforward genre movie. You know, here's the thing, though. People can you can say that like, oh, well, it's not trying to be this. It's trying to do this. But that doesn't mean the things it was trying to do are good. And even though we like we have said them before, like if a movie perfectly does everything it sets out to do, that's pretty much as close to a perfect movie as you're going to get. Um, yeah. But but that's not an evaluation. That's a yes. objective like observation. You're saying like this movie. And, but that doesn't it's not always true. Even if this movie did do everything it set out to do perfectly. I think it's lacking a couple of extra things that would make it like genuinely enjoyable. Even if they fixed the lighting, even if they like just like made some of the action scenes more interesting, even if they made the monsters scarier, the, all the elements that are here aren't enough for me to care enough about this story. You need a couple more things in the pot for it to be a good tasting soup. Oh, look at that foot. That was a good foot. It was like, Oh, Mr. Whoa. Arnold. Oh, also, what the fuck are these aliens? They're like... They're the most... Things. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like a hodgepodge of every fucking thing ever. And then we get smaller bird-like ones, or like bat-like ones, and we get bigger like hammerhead shark xenomorph ones. And Yeah, I mean, it is... I know it's hard to innovate all the time with different alien designs and everything. I mean, it's not as bad as like like the Independence Day aliens. Yeah. Which are just like... Okay, cool, buddy. But also it's it's hard to get under under it's it's hard to get out from under a movie like Alien with its design, right? Cuz I think it just nailed the like chrysalis like insect type alien so well that it's I don't know how you surpass that. But the answer to that too is like okay, try to be a little bit more clever in what you show or don't show, you know? Yeah. And then maybe make it a little bit more abstract when they're fluttering around. Um, that would be interesting too. Or maybe you see only certain parts of them at every, any given moment. So you just know them as like some sort of, okay, so we know that they have uh, a, like a long arm with a claw on it. We know that they have a tentacle. We know that, they, right? And you do something like that. That would be interesting too. Um, but again, it's it's hard to do that on a low budget. <laughs> we see Vin Diesel doing his... uh. Yeah. PWX workout video. <laughs> P90X, man. <Max>. Whatever. <laughs> or he, uh... <laughs> Damn, goddamn man. It's funny to think that's exactly what he was doing. He's exercising. I'm stuck here anyway. <laughs> no one else, I think, is just an interesting detail that should be celebrated about this movie, as small as it is, is that this movie, with the content in it, could totally pass for a PG-13 movie, and they made no attempt to try to make it PG-13. I appreciate that because I I really, uh, I don't know. I just appreciate that it's like, yes, let them say fuck a thousand times since they're in this situation. <laughs> yeah, it reeks less of studio meddling where it's just like, yes. do you really need the severed foot? Can't you just have like a slightly bloodied sneaker? Can't you just have like an obviously rubber finger? Yeah, no, <laughs> just no dismemberment, just like... Can, can't like the lights go out every single time somebody dies. So you never see anybody get torn in half. And do you think we can cast the kids from stranger things? <laughs> no, not yet. This would be a, uh, this 2000. What it would be the kids from spy kids. Can we put them in there? Too? <laughs> <laughs> I can't talk too much dude. As we all know from this podcast, I'd love <laughs> when the chick from spy kids is cast in other movies, but Oh, Alexa Vega. Yeah. Oh, I think she, was abducted off the face of the planet because I don't know what she's doing now. But not being in another Reaper the Genetic Opera movie, which is probably the correct career choice. For everyone. Yes. Yeah. Except me. <laughs> Just be used doing a cover of all the music. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, uh, the fucking homoerotic tension in this scene is palpable. I don't think so. I I don't think so either. <laughs> you just said that just because. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, it is two sweaty guys yeah. yelling at each other. Yeah. This movie he is... says, fuck you. Oh, this is the scene where he says, you should do me and ghost me. Yeah. We made a really great joke about that during the prep screening. Oh, amazing. Should have been there, everyone. <laughs> if you donate $500 a month on Patreon, you get to come and hang out with us in the recordings. Oh, and, man. In the pre screenings for our great jokes. Oh, boy. <laughs> 
So yeah, the one thing, the point I was driving at really in comparing um, the outlaw from the Western and the gangster is that I think this movie is in the way it contextualizes that outlaw. Uh, it's a beautiful shot, Max. For this the- is like that Twitter feed, one perfect shot. This. <laughs> For those who weren't watching, there was a wonderful shot of the desert curving up to either side of the Because they shot it in such a wide... It's like a fisheye lens. Yeah. But to the point where it's like... It looks like a parabola. <laughs> it looks... Just, it's, right? It's yeah. like... It's just like... It's curved from the entire like top side of the screen to the other one. So it looks like they're walking on a giant like valley or something. It looks very bizarre. But whatever, they're trying, Max. <laughs> I like Vin Diesel's delivery there. Richard B. Riddick, I like I think that's murderer. Some of the, I think that's some of the better facial acting we get from Vin Diesel. Where like he sees the handout and he's just like, Oh, this fucking guy's doing this. So okay. yeah. <laughs> like that's there are some charming things from Diesel's performance in this. And I think that's one of them. Um Well, that's what I was gonna say too about him sort of being a subversion of expectations with the convict type character is that uh, he is definitely not at all antisocial or anything. No, he he likes fucking with them. Yeah, you get the sense from the way he interacts with everyone. And this is part of the reason I think why you're like, he's not going to leave them at the end because he's like, he enjoys interacting with them. (laughs) He's never just like the, I'm weaker from people. But like, and her plea at the end, he's like, isn't there any part of you who wants to rejoin humanity? And it's like, he's been enjoying humanity. He's been hanging out, making jokes. Like, I don't know if he, you would say that that character has faith in himself that he could like reintegrate in no, the same but way, like, but he doesn't hate them. He doesn't shy away from humanity. Yeah. Despite his protests early on, he's like, I'm an animal. He struggles with that relationship, but he seems to enjoy the interactions that he does have with them. Especially with Jack. Um, yeah, and that's why I sort of enjoy his performance in this because he seems to be having fun <laughs> yeah. as like in that weirdly specific way. But of course, that gets to the one other big thing I um, started thinking about this movie and haven't mentioned yet, and that's whether or not you could maybe say that this movie relates at all to the type of like super predator rhetoric of like inmates in the 90s which seems may seem like it's coming out of left field, but let me contextualize this a little bit more. Uh, in film history, if you were to chart a, like just the genre of like prison movies and prison escape movies in America, you would see a very stark change start to occur in, around the seventies throughout the eighties. And then by the time you're in the nineties, you're at things like con air. And that is a very different, image of that genre from something like the great escape, right? Very different movie and very different idea of like prison. Um, Although to be fair the great escape is more specific because it's and the con, con air is objectively a better or not movie. war criminals than the great escape. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So certainly, um, or something like escape from Al- Alcatraz or whatever, or like brute force. It's a very different idea of jail and the people inside jail and a different, amount of sympathy granted to inmates. Whereas Con Air, they're like comically over the top evil, right? Those inmates are like the most insane evil people ever. They're basically super villains. And um, I think that's something that maybe coincides with the change in like public rhetoric about how, how we talk about incarceration and inmates in America throughout the eighties and nineties and with like, you know, growing crime rates among uh, a certain population uh, throughout the eighties and nineties, which now 20 years after the fact, after crime rates started to really decline in the like late nineties, a lot of people have started to hypothesize that there's some sort of connection between uh, leaded gasoline and violent crime. Well, yet lead in general. Yeah. Lead in paint, lead in pipes, but also, yeah, this movie came out in 2000, so this yeah, was right on the heels of that. Yeah. So, I mean, at the time, there's there's not as much hindsight and there's way more hysteria 
about it just publicly where people are you know freaking out about the super predators right the the type of people who um according to the the arguments that were made which were i'm assuming like by people like sociologists and everything in the field at the time talking about like, I think they were discredited at the time as being kind of irresponsible, but it made an impact publicly. Right. Um, and then of course there's the famous moment where Hillary, Hillary Clinton talked about it too. And then it made it like a real public thing. Right. So I think that leads to like a vilification of, of inmates and that type of character in movies as well. So for this character to be the super criminal Riddick, right? The way he's portrayed and everything, he seems like a con air (laughs) supervillain, right? Yeah. And then the movie subverts that and he's kind of just... A guy. Yeah, but more specifically, you know who he is? He is the future version of that rugged, individualist, romanticized Western outlaw. And the movie is... I don't think this is intentional, but I think the movie is arguing like... Listen, the same thing that made this would have made this guy a romanticized, rugged individualist, basically the bread and butter of America in that popular mythology of how the country was made, is what actually is responsible for him being criminalized and dehumanized by society as it is. And it's less because of him, but it's more because society ain't so great. Yeah. Well, he's he has his problems, but his existence points out the bigger problems that society itself has. Yeah. It's his rugged, his like demeanor and his, uh, basically the whole reason he's actually an embodiment of that archetype at all. This movie would argue is, uh, due to some sort of like structural inequality in this future space society. Right. And in this world where there are space faring, community, right? The society is spread everywhere and is ubiquitous. There is no more frontier really. No. So space is no longer the final frontier. Yeah. It's dystopian. And, uh, there's no, there's nothing he can do. And his rugged individualism, those traits, the hyper masculinism is sort of a byproduct of that because that's how he survives. (laughs) That's the only thing he could do. And I, again, I don't think the movie really explores that all too much or is even trying to really articulate it. I just think in making this a sci-fi Western, but also taking a type of convict character that at least for the last like 10 years prior in American movies has been mostly portrayed as a like comical supervillain, like, but also like repulsive, you know what I mean? Like rapist, drug, like not just bad. I mean like repulsive and monstrous. Um, yeah, like Nicolas Cage in Face Off, he was the ultimate prisoner man. Um, was he? Kind of, yeah. He, <laughs> he was a rapist. He was. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes. Also, I'm just sorry you said Con Air, so I'm my brain is in <laughs> Nicolas Cage mode. I mean, Riddick seems like he's just so much out of Con Air. It's funny. <laughs> Richard B. Riddick, escaped convict and murderer. Do you remember the scene where they're doing like the dossier of all yeah. of them? I'm just Nicolas Cage's fucking mullet in that movie. Nikita Khrushchev. I don't know who he got here, but that's fine. Barry, put him on. Okay. <laughs> not on not to be point out plot holes in this movie, because I could have done 80 million already. Sure. But later they're just like, we have no lo- idea how long this darkness will last, so we can't stay here. But they stop turning the model. The Orrery? The yeah. second movie on the Spectator Film Podcast with an RRE. We'll try to keep doing RRE-related films just for you. Um, but if they kept clicking, they could be like... I don't know. Maybe it's a shitty model. I love this line delivery. Sorry. Where he, she's talking about the cells, and then he's like, maybe just bring him up at the last minute. And she's like, what's the fucking discussion, Johns? What's the problem? Yeah. She says fuck three times in that sentence. And it seems totally like an improvisation, but I just love... There's certain weird lines and character interactions in this movie that feel like impressively true to the situation to me where I'm like, this is like a weird thing to say about a movie that's like not super impressive overall was like, actually in this specific moment, I really do buy that these are two people stuck on a, who crash landed on a planet and they're trying to get off before the weird monsters eat them. Mostly it has to do with Rada Mitchell. She's quite good.
And I also think she's Australian, so this is probably something she's used to dealing with. The cassowaries come out at night. <laughs> they come to just rip you to shreds. What did you like? Did you watch a video of somebody like getting fucking destroyed by a cassowary? Or something? No, what happened was I was so obsessed with dinosaurs as a kid, Max. I can't like I know kids are obsessed with dinosaurs. No, I was too. Yeah. But. Um, I took it to like a new level. I just loved it. And uh, I would also try to learn as much as possible about birds because I'm like, they're like dinosaurs, you guys. And uh, I, I was very interested in cassowaries as a young child because in my mind, that was like the closest bird we had to a velociraptor. <laughs> That's another good delivery by Diesel. But- I don't know if it is, though. One thing I was thinking, too, about his like specific performance is that like i don't know if it's good acting but i buy that like it's very it's boring (laughs) but i'm like maybe riddick is just boring like i buy that he's boring (laughs) yes some of the editing in this movie is like that fence jumping sequence and taken yeah yeah it's like what the fuck are you doing did somebody like fall asleep? You edited this at like, you just hired like a, like a TD to do this, like a live show. And they just like <laughs> fucked up. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'm, I guess we're supposed to feel like uneasy and surprised by having 80 cuts in two seconds, but also that's not how you make a movie. No, <laughs> that sounds like something a film student is like, it's supposed to make you uneasy. Right. And I'm like, I guess in theory, but no, <laughs> re-edit this jimmy maybe watch more movies and then do it again <laughs> but i've seen the taken series 80 times how many more <laughs> movies do i need to see blue Sum, I'm, i've mastered an understanding of that visual rhetoric i think this is a good interaction though i like his delivery here i think it's really interesting because as we were saying riddick does enjoy fucking with them because i think he doesn't really know how else to interact with them but also like he doesn't seem to talk down to her here. He doesn't pretend that she doesn't know how he escaped. And he doesn't pretend to think like, Oh, that wouldn't make you uncomfortable. Would it? He knows. And he's okay with that, but he's also treating her like an adult and like, you know, stating his case. Right. Yeah. But he's also sniffing her like an animal would prey. Yes. Thus the movie is confused about itself. (laughs) But however, also one thing I noticed is that there's a lot of lines in moments in which the movie refers to people, but mostly Riddick in ways that are comparable to like animals, which again, in my mind kind of plays into that like super predator rhetoric, which by the way is totally racist and completely dehumanizing, but also like, playing into the structural inequality of that. It's like, okay, his, so his macho masculinity in some ways in my mind is like dehumanizing in its own right, but he still has to embrace it. I don't know if that's making sense what I'm saying. But he's referred to as like an, he refers to himself as an animal, um, later when they're talking about, or no earlier when, uh, when he's like, you're missing the party, come on. Uh, John's. <laughs> I know that silhouette was supposed to make him look like slightly heroic with the sunlight around him, but like the way it phased out, he just looked like a goofy stick figure, man. <laughs> <laughs> he is very goofy. Um, but yeah, earlier John's, when he's talking about like who's going to drag the power cells because he's super heavy, he's like, well, we could get, hold on, where's Riddick? So he's looking at him like a pack mule. Yeah. Right. And there's numerous other lines where they refer to people as like pieces of meat or whatever in in a way that's kind of interesting. But I do think the movie associates Riddick's very hyper masculine traits with as something that's like a byproduct of just him being dehumanized, but also responding to that in a way where he becomes a certain thing in order to survive, which includes, of course, surgically changing his eyes oh we missed that line about the shine job god damn it i don't care um, hashtag i thought shine okay job this is something that annoys me just as a a chekhov's gun type thing what 
So we established that he keeps the morphine that he's addicted to in shotgun shells in order to transport it because he has a shotgun. So yeah. So what I thought was going to happen is we're going to have his addiction literally come back and bite him in the ass. We should and, shoot the... And he, no, he's going to like try to load one of those things and it's going to like ah. break inside the gun. And it would have literally just been like, oh, look, your addiction literally came back and fucking screwed you over. See how it wasn't making you better? That's the thing. Like you don't show morphine inside shotgun shells if you're not going to have those fucking loaded into it later. Or you don't show a gun itself if they don't use it later. Yeah. Which they don't. So basically Chekhov put that gun on the mantle and David Tui walked up and said, fuck you. Yeah. And then just like nailed it to the wall. <laughs> it's not coming down. You can't use that later. It's just, you don't set up like cool little things like that. If you're not going to do anything with them. I, although I don't know if there's a, um, some sort of moment like that in the extended cut. I know in the extended cut. I don't cut, care. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. If it wasn't a big thing, then like you didn't pay it off properly. And if it's not in there, then my statement still stands 100%. I mean, they give it this close up and everything. So you're yeah. like, oh, I mean, even him being a drug user in the first place doesn't really do anything other than to make him seem less sympathetic, which also is kind of a reactionary yeah. thing in and of itself. We should be against him because he's. He's really generally to, a fucking prick and also like willing to put everybody's safety at risk so yeah. he can get paid more for delivering Riddick. That's the reason. The drug thing is like that doesn't make him a worse person, especially because he's addicted to morphine. And in the extended cut, even though this doesn't matter, the real reason he got addicted to morphine is because he's been chasing Riddick for a while. And Riddick uh, at one point uh, jammed a shiv into his spine. And now he takes morphine to deal with the pain. So. Like many Americans, he's merely <laughs> a victim of the opioid. Epidemic. Yes. So not that unsympathetic, really, on its own. And uh, I think, you know, un I think it was a smart decision to cut out the explanation because I appreciate that this lawman is actually revealed to be just a fucking prick. However, in doing that, the remnants of that with the morphine seems more just like the movie is judging him for it, which is kind of like, okay, like I don't. It's not cool. <laughs> I think I think that's this might be a good time to bring up my problem with some of the masculine. And it's like this movie's almost a purity test for like the macho masculine indie man type right. thing. Where you have to <laughs> like you have to meet certain criteria. Like you have to believe in God, but you don't have to like him. You have to be clean, willing to kill to do what you want. And you can't be like a fey, a feminine guy who you cares. have to be willing to, you have to be able to endure pain. The classic standby. Yes. Of masculinity. You can't be a fey. Yeah. A feminized man who likes artifacts and luxury things in order to survive. Like it almost comes like <laughs> we have Zeke die when the only thing we know about him is he doesn't believe in God. Um, we have, <laughs> Yeah, fucking pretentious collector man die. The antiquarian? Yeah. See, I don't get the impression that because he's fey, though. He's He was fanning himself. He was smoking a cigar. He was drinking expensive wine under a parasol. I think it's more supposed to be a, an image of like a certain type of decadence. Yeah, but a lot of that is sort of... Here's where the lighting changes for the yeah. better, by the way. I think it instantly starts to look a little bit cooler. Yeah. Although they could have leaned more into like a Planet of the Vampires aesthetic. That probably would have worked well. As if as long as you're doing fucking weird colors for the rest of your movie, why? <laughs> and lots of more dried ice everywhere. Exactly. That'd be fun, even though it's a desert. Your movie's always improved by dry ice. <laughs> yeah. Citizen Kane, shit, needs more dry ice. <laughs> yes, it's the worst. Goodfellas, fuck that movie, dry ice. That's actually why uh, Martin Scorsese called the Mar Marvel movies not real cinema. Yeah, there's no dry ice in yeah, any of they them. they suck. <laughs> they use CGI <laughs> they smoke, which doesn't look as good. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's fucking Kermit the Frog transition so there. Anybody who's not watching the movie along with us will uh, be confused by what we just laughed at. And what happened was Vin Diesel 
to run from the monsters that are finally coming because now it's the eclipse is starting to happen and it's starting to get dark out. He there's a close up of him and he leaves frame quickly, but he like leaves with his body first and then his head follows. Oh. So it looks like a cartoon character like leaving frame or like a like a Muppet. He leads with like his chest yeah. and then his head is like. Rrr. So he's just I don't know. Vin Diesel is silly. <laughs> In a way that I kind of like enjoy because it's just like, ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> also, how does Vin Diesel know to do this? Because he's perfect in this. I mean, all that's the other thing about like the Western outlaw character is that they're totally like a Mary Sue type of character. Yeah. I mean, like the good and the good, the bad and the ugly is like so fucking good at everything. Although even at that point, I would say that's more of a revision of the classic yeah. version of it. But the classic version is like, they are the man of the West. And that is, it's the West is the thing that legitimates their masculinity. Cause that's the big thing about it. It's masculine identity and the forging of a new society. So you make a society in your image and, uh, in doing so you, you do all these different tasks involved with, with setting that up and you're perfect at it because you're the rugged individualist. You don't need anyone else to do anything because you're the best at everything. Unless it's a feminine sort of thing. Like liking. Like being kind. Being kind or liking things that aren't shaving your head with motor oil and a shiv. and <laughs> Which, dude, you could find some... Yeah, they, they <laughs> some shaving cream at this place. I'm sure. It's, they, I'm sure it's future shaving cream. It won't go bad or like have an expiration date. Yeah, or anything. and they said that they left everything behind. You could have found like or just a regular razor, but I guess you have to do, exert your big dick energy over fucking everybody. That is totally a trope of like macho men is like shaving with something that is not a razor mm -hmm. and using something that is not shaving cream, and it is always disgusting. Uh. It seems like. They always think they're being tough. Actually, the same thing happened in Predator. Do you remember? <laughs> Where Bill Duke is shaved. Although, to be fair, that's supposed to more show that he's cracked up and gone crazy. Is that he's brought a razor with him, like a plastic one, and then he snaps it against his skin. Yeah. After um, uh, the Jesse the Body Ventura is killed. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just thinking of, like, I don't have time to bleed. Goddamn sexual tyrannosaur. <sighs> What's wrong, Max? This movie is eating away at my soul like a bunch of alien vampire bats eating away at my torso. Oh, okay. I'd rather piss glass. I don't remember him saying that when we watched it in the uh <laughs> No, neither do I. Yeah. I think our brains just mutually were just like either way, that's a disgusting image. Wish he did not say that. <laughs> that's one of those lines that like is in the background and they're just like you know that when that happens in movies, when it's just like there's a line that's spoken by a character in the background that like you're not really supposed to hear, but then when the subtitles come on, you're just like Oh wow, he you know. said that. Yeah. That's like, uh, uh, there's sometimes there's good examples of that too. When we watch death, death of Stalin, you're like, Oh, I don't remember <laughs> them saying that. <sighs> Jesus Christ. What? So many cuts. Just like, you don't <laughs> just because like nothing is currently dying. Doesn't mean you need to. <laughs> cut around a bunch to keep the audience entertained. That's the other interesting thing about this movie is that it sort of feels like an action movie. Cause Vin Diesel is very much the spitting image of that like eighties hard body masculinity. But he, he's also like, there aren't a lot of action scenes. No, but like he's reminiscent of like this era, like the rock, like the, just like big <laughs> bald muscular and not a lot. I mean, The Rock is genuinely more enjoyable when he's on screen, but he's not a great actor. I'm not going to see that. I don't know. Well, uh, that type of, yeah, that type of like Hollywood actor is like very much there for their persona 
and a certain type of charisma that they bring from role to role, right? And they can be very good in doing that. But I feel like it is definitely like a different standard through which you evaluate their performance almost. Um, However, I I do think it it is very much like that lineage of action hero, except this movie doesn't have action scenes in it. It's just sort of walking scenes, which is why it is really relying on that Western structure because they're just moving through this empty landscape and then talking about how they're going to do it. Right. It's really them versus nature is ultimately what this movie is. And uh, it, it feels like an action movie at different moments in between, or there are scenes of action, right? And unfortunately, this poor boy uh, does not speak English. Is and, that uh, what it is? Yeah. No, no, no. None of the kids speak English. So Vin Diesel is like, don't move, buddy. Don't move. I thought it was just that he failed Vin Diesel's masculinity test. No, he can't understand him. That's slightly more sympathetic than... <laughs> you were just a fucking pussy, so you didn't get to live along with me, Mr. Manly Man Vin Yeah, Diesel. no, I don't really get the impression that this movie is a... um. Ooh, that's a really brutal kill, too. It just gets, like, sawed in half. I don't really get the impression that this movie is like a... um. Oh, here's my favorite moment coming up, too. Uh, for some reason... I'll interrupt myself for some reason, this moment where Vin Diesel gets flashed in the eyes with the <laughs> light and the way he screams watching the movie this week, I just kept rewinding it cause it kept making me laugh. <laughs> it almost looks like an outtake, but like it's just in the movie, just the noise he makes. He's like, <laughs> I don't know why I find it so funny. And then the body language too. He's just, I understand what it sort of is, but the fact of Vin Diesel doing it in the way that he does is just amusing to me. <laughs> and not in a way where it's like so bad it's good. It's just like, well, that was kind of awkward, wasn't it? <laughs> but yeah, I, I was going to say, I don't really feel like this movie is um, some sort of like, I don't know, ritualistic purge of everything that isn't uber masculine. Um, I do think like a lot of Westerns, Vin Diesel is able to survive because he embodies that vision of masculinity. I kind of, I don't know, the movie comes off that way to me. But also, like, he's not entirely able to be the true rugged individualist anyway because what happens at the end? He needs Roda Mitchell. It feels sort of <laughs> awkward and ham-fisted like a lot of the rest of this movie, but that's the point, is, like, he's going to die without her, even though he's better two seconds later. Well, um, okay, so... We're approaching the end of this movie. No, we're not. Yes, we are. Um, <laughs> no, we're not. The third act, at least. Um, mm-hmm. eh, no, not really. We still got like a solid probably 15 minutes before the third act kind of kicks into gear. Don't tell me that. But anyway. <laughs> <sighs> we are well into the premise part of it. Right? But anyway, so and I said at the beginning of the thing, one of the problems I have with the structure of this is Vin Diesel kind of ate our female leads character arc. Like they have to share it because they only had enough budget for one character arc. And there's kind of two ways where you can end up with that, where Vin Diesel is the animalistic loner who doesn't trust people because he's been thrown into prison for all of his life. Yeah. He's alienated. Yeah. And the way you'd normally, in a script work that out is he learns that trusting people is okay. And it's okay to put others above himself and probably would perform a heroic sacrifice in order to make sure they got off the planet, even though he had the opportunity to like get off by himself. Yeah. Or you have our female lead learned that, she needs to stop putting herself above others and redeem herself for nearly killing the crew in the beginning of, or killing everybody else in the beginning of the movie by learning to trust Riddick. And they, with the power of their like, okay, we did this save everybody together, but the movie kind of does neither of those. And it kind of feels like an unsatisfying ending because the of thing that. is it, it, you don't really get the impression that Riddick is actually going through that character arc. Yes. For most of the movie. And maybe that's a failure of performance or directing 
in terms of telling or Vin screenwriting Diesel, or a, probably a mixture of all three. Yeah. But really in the last two seconds, he's when he's like, not for me. It's like, that's when he's, he's having like, his what? character moment. And you're like, wait, this was happening to you. <laughs> I mean, that makes sense. Like you're saying, right. Yeah. Some sort of reintegration narrative, which is what it winds up being. But it is, it feels weird because you're like, this is the moment for Rada Mitchell. And then she dies. <laughs> Which I mean is, you know, a thing you can do in a movie like this where it's like, okay, our character has completed their arc. Do we need them? No, goodbye. I mean, I feel like that's a decision a lot of writers are maybe scared to make often. And I appreciate more if they do find a way to do that. Only it feels like it's a little bit awkward here, you know? And um, Because we don't know Riddick at all, even though like the movie keeps pushing him into the center of the No, no, no. I think it's that we think we know Riddick. Yeah, I guess I can see where we get the impression we know him. And I think we're like, okay, we, we get this and we're rolling with this. And then suddenly that happens and it's like, oh, and I don't think it like spins the movie off into the ether, but it, it does feel like they kind of like bungled the landing a little bit to me. Um, anyway, I just, it is always a little bit aggravating too, when like the male's character arc again, again, happens because of something the woman does. And also the woman needs to sacrifice herself for the man to have a character. Yeah. It's like, again, again, that's also a thing with the Westerns too, is like the woman character is very frequent. The good woman it's referred to that type of character where there are more civilizing force. That's like communicating to the Western outlaw gunslinger figure where they're like, you don't have to be violent. You don't have to do this. And then the Western gunslinger is like, it has to be done. It's all I know how to do these days. Yeah, because they're like doomed yeah. to be this uncivilized hero. And um, this is something Warshaw argues in that essay as well. Is like the most interesting Westerns are usually the ones that actually make the most reasonable arguments on both sides and make that decision the most complicated it can actually be, right? Because usually the way we're describing it, it just becomes some sort of like stupid masculine fantasy. Right. Where it's like you have to justify acting out violence to legitimize your own manhood. Right. But what if the situation actually is a little bit hard to manage, you know, and you're like, I don't know what to do. Right. Then it becomes an actual discussion. And that's interesting. But, yeah, I it does kind of feel like suddenly that's what happens at the end in a way that feels like, no, Rada Mitchell was carrying this entire movie. And it's like, oh, she's dead now. Okay. But also at the same time, it something like that kind of makes sense for Vin Diesel's character arc that, again, was revealed in that very moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it does make sense because it's like, okay, what is the thing that gets him to reintegrate with the society entirely? Somebody is willing to do that for him in a way that he would never have expected them to do. <laughs> I love these rave lights that we have. <laughs> yes, they just came from way. the rave. They're playing the song <laughs> Sandstorm. <laughs> this is the year 1999. Yes. Actually, this Sandstorm probably was still pretty big <laughs> at the time. Yeah. I mean, Sandstorm was big for years after that. Well, those aliens, you know, rely on echolocation. You could confuse them <laughs> <laughs> with bizarre, like, <laughs> EDM music or whatever. <laughs> That's probably what I tried to do is like distract them with some like speakers or something. Or that would just give away your location really quick. You put it far away. (laughs) Just play some glitch mob. You know. Anything that's loud. I do want to make like one of those gift sets like me and the boys walking home from the rave. (laughs) (laughs) You start blasting like public enemy. (laughs) And all the ends are like... The second time he's pointed a gun at her. This I also think is really stupid. This makes me hate the kid Jack because like you seriously took off your glow stick device to chase what now? What even fucking was it like a flashlight or something? It's like, listen, tell them to stop for a second, leave your shit on and just grab it. You stupid jackass. Despite my dislike of the creature design in this movie, this was one of the 
few interesting and slightly creepy Almost shots. too much. Man. Yeah. I'm going to say that this does feel like the type of thing where it's like somebody thought of this, wrote it down on a napkin, and they worked out the rest of the movie, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, I mean, yeah. Works as an idea, right? Yeah. <laughs> It feels like it belongs in a different movie. It would have been cooler if somehow they'd been able to show less of the monsters yeah. so that it looks more like abstract and that's like a really neat moment. I also, there are certain visual things that I really do appreciate. Like the Riddick vision. It's like, you know what? If nothing else, they did find a way to really create a new like specific vision thing that is not like very re redundant in terms of like comparing it to former iterations of like the weird vision trope. Like it doesn't resemble, you know, other monster vision that we've seen in movies like the predator or anything. It really does feel like its own thing. Same with the, uh, the actual vision of the aliens, I think. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. Cause it, it does almost seem to visually look like what that must look like where it doesn't, it seems like it's like a sense. It's a bunch it looks like pointillism almost. And then some of the stuff is like relieved where they detect shapes, right? Where it looks like it's a bunch of different points and some are raised and some are depressed. And it almost looks like what it might be to um, sort of see with like nerves attached to sound, you know, instead of just your eyes, which is interesting. Oh, here we get the incredibly bizarre moment, which we haven't brought up at all, but the Jack gender reveal moment. Remember this? Yeah. yeah. No. Also, I noticed rewatching it this time that when he says they know the taste of our blood now, we get a close up of her face. Yeah. There are certain shots that like clue you in on that, which I have to be honest, Max, with the first time I watched this again for the show, I forgot about this scene and I just thought, they were a girl <laughs> the whole time. So I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. But also it's, it is kind of like bizarre moment. Also Keith David has, this is where the Keith David stuff starts to go off the rails where he gets these very bizarre close-ups in the scene where it seems like somebody just told him like something for, for the craft <laughs> services lunch menu was something he really hates. And he's like, oh, okay. <sighs> and then later he gets the greatest like shoulder shrug in film history, which I'm sure we'll laugh at and point out. But this moment is very weird because I think the movie is not focused enough on its subtext to really understand what this movie's opinion of the Jack character is. I think it couches the gender stuff in conservative terms, but I just don't understand. Okay. So here's what it's going the thing forward. in a world where the Chronicles of Riddick does not exist. Okay. I could charitably read this as a sort of kick in the balls to the notion that only the hyper masculine can survive. It's as long as you have the skills and the knowledge and the will to act like Rick does, you can survive in this world. But <laughs> two things happen in the Chronicles of Riddick that make me think that they don't care about that. What? One, Jack comes back. Yes. And she is super sexy hot lady now who has apparently forgotten most. Jacqueline. Yeah. Who has forgotten most of the things that she learned on this planet. And two, she dies. Okay. So that Riddick can feel things again because Riddick apparently cared about her a lot. I'm going to say I don't care about that. So I'm going to say no to that. But also what I'm going to say is that's a moment that's just like very easy to play devil's advocate advocate for because I don't understand really what the true intention is. Yeah. Primarily though, I know that that scene is ultimately there to be the nail in the coffin for John's. Right. If we were not ready for him to d die before that we are now. And, um, it's interesting because he's the one demonstrating the hyper masculine behavior in that moment. And it's specifically something that's like antisocial and puts the group at risk, which is kind of interesting, Yeah. but also like, I just don't know what what the movie's opinion of that Jack character is. I don't think it considers her to be like transsexual in any way or, or no. like or, I'm sorry, transgendered in any way, but also like it doesn't indicate and it has no it comes up and then it goes away. You know what I mean? 
Yeah. It's just not brought up again. I guess it's sort it's of... It's supposed to be like, oh, that's why they know where we are, even though obviously they know where we are. Like, But also it's just kind of like, why? I, I, The only thing it really obviously is there to serve is, again, to be the final thing needed if we needed anything else to justify this fight sequence between Riddick and Johns. Right? So I don't really know what it's there for. I think ultimately it it is also kind of like a uh like a weird fan thing where it's like it's almost like okay, Riddick is the awesome cool action hero, right? Well, the girls can like that too, right? So make her a girl who's like imitating Riddick in a lot of ways. And it's like, if this, okay, like, I don't know. I don't know that if either. this movie had more like shirtless Vin Diesel and because like we get, we get some biceps shots of Vin Diesel a lot for this movie. We don't see him nice and sweaty and oiled up and shirtless like you would if you were like trying like a lot of action movies do to appease the girlfriends who get dragged along to go see this movie with their drooling boyfriends. I would argue that's not the intent of that for a lot of action movies, but go ahead. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it depends on how gratuitous some of the shots are. I would say it's there to please the boyfriends that drag their girlfriends to the movie it, too. But it's, it fulfills a dual purpose. It yes. gives them like, yeah, look how fucking badass and macho they are. And also gives the girlfriend like, eh, hmm, yeah. But, um, <laughs> Fucking, um, it's, I don't know. Cause it doesn't matter. That's the ultimate thing is that it doesn't come back again after. So it's like, it's hard to tell what it is. All I know is that it's interesting to me that the movie uses it as a moment to make a judgment about John's right. And say that, no, 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 he's the one that's bad. And also it's a moment where it's, further emphasizing the fact that the Jack character is, is sort of like consuming the character of Riddick in the way the movie hopes the audience will as well, where they're like, Oh, look how cool Riddick is, blah, 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 blah. Which is kind of interesting too. Even if I really have no idea what to make of it. Uh, We we know he has the powers to smell her period blood. So that's, (laughs) that's a fucking, a fucking plus thing. Just like John Wayne. (laughs) Western outlaw. They're going to say John Wick. I'm just like, wow. (laughs) (laughs) Oh God. And again, this is the movie saying fuck Johns. He's the only character we see get like, well, no, actually that woman gets, yeah, that fucking more, that woman, that that death feels really kind of mean spirited to me. It's a mortal combat fatality. (laughs) It reminds me of that death scene. That's like made me like go crazy. Like, the first time I saw Jurassic world. Have you ever seen Jurassic world? Mm. There's a scene where the like pterodactyls. Oh yeah. They fuck with this one woman for like 80 years. It's like, what is, what is <laughs> like, why, why this is like watching a saw movie now. It's like they drop this woman and they like throw her between their mouths and then they get swallowed by a Mosasaur. And it's like, God damn it. But of course, here's the other interesting thing is that, uh, even though Vin Diesel crassly outs her, um, or them. Cause we don't really know. Well, no, we do because in the next movie, she's, I don't care about the next movie. The next <laughs> movie doesn't exist. It does not matter. Um, we Listen, don't, I would, I would love if they were transgender and non-binary, that would add, I'm not saying they are. I'm saying that in this movie is not ambiguous and you cannot select yeah. Chronicles of Riddick to inform this movie unless you're sort of putting those two things together, which it's equally valid to not do that because Chronicles of Riddick does not exist in this movie. I wish it didn't exist at all. It doesn't have to. So, uh, but my point is that, um, we really don't know what their situation with their gender is. So I guess it's just easiest to call them. They, but what was I saying about them? Oh, I think it's interesting that, um, even though Vin Diesel kind of like reveals that about them, that it's like, he also seems to care most about her response to the whole thing in the following scene. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, the Jack character comes to represent in this movie sort of, um, 
more of that Western idea of an open frontier and a, a future where agency and individualism is can potentially uh, become real again for these characters and they can sort of escape the hellhole that they're in. Or at least some idea of a new, different society that is not trapped in the loop of like terrible masculinity represented by both Riddick and Johns. I wish we had given uh, Keith David more time before this because he does start having a lot of speaking roles and like good moments in the last little bit of the movie. The real problem is uh, his character is just caricature to begin with. <laughs> it's not even that drastic though. I don't like, I just, I just, uh, it's I, boring. Yeah. It's just it's caricature default. would imply like it's done to a degree where it's comical, but it's not. It's but I just, mean, there's just nothing added to it, you yeah. know, like, okay. So the Holy man is an archetype. In a Western type movie, right? Yeah. Oh, let's put you have the you have we'll let's make put it, this man's faith to the test because the real world is yeah, much harder than, than civilization. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, he's on a pilgrimage. It's almost like he's also on a pilgrimage with this. Yes. So it's like, okay, but they don't do like especially in the way that they direct the actors, there's it seems like there's nothing being added to the equation. So it feels like caricature because it's so overused and just it's been done in the genre that it's like you just inherited this trope and then this trope is so common that it just feels like a cartoon now. There's nothing about this that's unique to this individual. They don't feel like a real person. Okay. I want to talk about the do not look up thing. Okay. They're eating each other. See, we're terrified that we won't be able to last, but like one if I want to be fucking annoying, I'd be like, how has this species lasted so long if they just fucking eat each other whenever it's dark? But I don't care. There about are that. lots of people that talk about this movie this way. It's yeah. like, listen, this movie isn't that great, but that criticism is just like stupid and annoying. Especially They're the people who are like, what are the odds? They land on a planet in this year of the exact day or whatever when the eclipse is happening after 22 years where also it coincidentally uh, there's oxygen and coincidentally Riddick can see in the dark because he coincidentally got a shine job. Uh, 100% because that's the way the script was written. Yeah, that's also the premise of the movie. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, if that didn't happen, do you want to just watch them go on like a magic school bus trip to like <laughs> fucking the space market or whatever? Kind of, yeah. <laughs> it's like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, isn't it a fucking coincidence that in Transformers there's robots <laughs> what a fucking coincidence. Lucky for this movie called Transformers. There's Transformers in it. Isn't it fucking lucky for Luke Skywalker that the Death Star had a fucking <laughs> hole that he could shoot it in? What are the fucking odds in that? Yeah. I mean, god damn it. Isn't it... Isn't it lucky that Sauron made a fucking ring that he, he could throw into a volcano and it would kill him what and all of his armies? What a coincidence that in a movie called Pirates of the Caribbean... There are pirates in the Caribbean. Yeah. I don't really necessarily <laughs> believe that, do I? But anyway, that's not what I was talking about. <laughs> I was saying that like if the creatures eat each other, couldn't you just like hang out in the bunker and not have them eat you? And then when they get hungry enough, because apparently they need to be constantly eating because that's yeah. all they do. Can't you just wait for them to like all eat each other until there's like one left on the other side of the planet and then you can just make a run for the ship? I guess, but also like not really. I mean, the thing about the monsters too that would have been aided by them being treated in a more abstract way. Um, I mean, first off, oh, <laughs> that, that was some editing. First off, the big problem with these monsters is that he did not know who he was fucking with. <laughs> As Vin Diesel just says. Um, but also, like, I think the monsters are supposed to be... Um, this is the other thing I didn't mention about this movie. I feel like it's kind of also taking a, an idea from a really neat Isaac Asimov story called Nightfall where there's this society of a bunch of, with a ton of suns, right? And it's daytime constantly for like years and years and years to the point where their entire society, they've never known darkness. And then there's an eclipse for like a day or something. Yeah. But it's this big thing where the scientists predict it and then everybody, nobody knows what will happen or, <laughs> or like, oh my God, everybody's like preparing for like an apocalypse, right? And then it happens and nothing happens it's just people can't deal with the dark 
because they don't know what to make of it. So people start to go crazy and start like killing each other and forming mobs and going insane. So it's a neat story. And I think this is kind of interesting too, where it's like, okay, we break out of like a certain idea of civilization. And once we're in the wilderness, there's like this, we realize like, oh my God, there's this chaos that in a kind of abstract and figurative way is just going to totally consume us if we can't get out. So I feel like it makes sense for them to be cannibalistic because what is more, nothing is like as totally like bizarre to the human mind and um, without a sense of reason as things like cannibalism, you know, or more specifically like an Ouroboros thing. That's why in that movie Antichrist, uh, there's that fox that says, chaos reigns to Willem Dafoe, and he looks really confused. But the fox is eating himself while he's doing that, and it's really bizarre. Because when things eat each other, it's like like one of the most unnatural things to imagine, right? So I feel like this, these monsters are kind of a presence of that in this movie. It's like they are, they're like the wilderness drawn out to its extreme they're going to be totally chaotic and and just consume completely everyone. unrelated to everything we're talking about what um how do you feel about casper noe movies uh i'm trying to think if i've seen one i don't think i have and i don't know how much interest i have in seeing them <sighs> i only say that because i have friends who love uh enter the void um He just seems like somebody I would find annoying. Yeah. Well, like I find him like who look at me and he seems like a European Eli Roth and like people in America think you're cool just because you're European kind of you're smart because you're European. It's like, but I know better. (laughs) A lot of it is just like, it is like an artsy Eli Roth movie. Yeah. Almost. We're like, I'm going to do this one very beautifully lit long take shot of just the most horrific fucking shit I can imagine. And I'm like, I think my response to that is like, you're still a bitch. <laughs> like that doesn't make you like hardcore. Thank you for giving me that terminology to describe how I've always felt about Enter the void. Cause it's like a lot of these movies like that are like just a director being like, look how serious this is. By the way, can't you tell that my dick is huge? <laughs> right. <laughs> And it's like, I don't know. Cause nothing tri- like that ever compares to something as excoriating as like a Godard movie or like even just Citizen Kane. Because like, I've tried to, I'm not trying to compare it to Citizen Kane. I'm trying to compare it to a movie I'd like I would sit down and find enjoyable. I'm just saying in terms of like an idea of like this movie is brutal and unrelenting and what it's showing you. Yeah. It's like, it's not even as unrelenting as like something from 1941 like Citizen Kane. Because that movie is as intelligent about what's going on and it's about a man who's been totally consumed and like rotting away on the inside but also is awful to everyone he comes into contact with and that has that's far more vicious of a movie than something like irreversible which i don't even like what is the point of that it might be bizarre to compare them but i'm talking about like more the way people perceive that type of movie than the movie itself and the idea of like why you would make that type of movie. I just don't, that's why regardless of what I might think about it, if I saw it, that's why I have no interest in it. I mean, I've tried to finish Enter the void, uh, five times. I've never made it all the way through the movie in one sitting. Um, yeah, there's so many good movies I haven't seen. Exactly. So like, why do I care? (laughs) I did it. I saved the city. And it's very, I don't know. I'm not going to be like, wow, it's it's fortunate they found the glow bugs in this thing. Yeah, they're the little larva. They have to scrape off the uh, The Jack Daniels product placement. So they didn't get sued or or something, I guess. No. Maybe Jack Daniels. We saw the Jack Daniels before. Okay, good. So we know it was definitely product placement. I don't know. If you need to make a Molotov cocktail lantern and when you're getting chased by aliens, choose none other than Jack Daniels. Also, yet again, not to be that guy, but bioluminescence doesn't really work like that. (laughs) Ah, That's okay. The real, the only real inconsistency, because again, with as far as criticisms like that go, I think you and I are of the school that it's the premise of the movie. It doesn't matter. But also what matters more than that is, is the premise consistent with its own rules that it establishes? Yeah. 
That's what matters more. You can say, okay, this is the world of the movie and it could be something totally crazy and weird. But as long as you are actually committed to not violating those rules, it kind of works, doesn't it? Or at least things like that just feel like stupid and pointless nitpicks. And of course, you just don't really get the impression, at least for, from both of us, that like Vin Diesel is ever going to leave. You, it always feels like he's fucking with her. And she says as much. Yeah. Or more specifically, what is also possible is, it, I don't know if even the vehicle is capable of this, but it seems like he's going to just pick them up. <laughs> that would make more sense, wouldn't it? Yeah, and like this is like the first time where we get the, like the feeling that he is going to. Like, this is the first time that like it would ever cross your mind. It was like, oh, he's going to leave them behind. But like, it's inconsistent with everything we've seen about him before. Or it's it's relying too much on what we might expect of him out of the gate instead of like what he, we've shown. If he was okay, the audience. With, yeah, and if he was okay with letting everybody die, he would have just fucking gone along with. Uh, fuck face his plan earlier on and then let him die as well. Just leave yeah. them all as bait so he can get to the ship. He was the one with the power cells anyway, and he clearly didn't need her to get the ship going. And so. that does relate back to what we're talking about, about the Western archetype, the Western hero archetype and the use of violence. Why did he use violence on Johns? Because Johns was threatening the group. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It was for, it was in the name of some sort of moral code or understanding of the world that, he did that, and he was probably willing to let Johns continue to survive until that conversation. <laughs> you know, he wasn't the one who was scheming against Johns to, like, yeah. kill him and, and dispose of him, even though I'm sure it would have been easier for Riddick to do so than, uh, than the opposite, right? Yeah. Johns is, like, doubled over whenever he's not, like, having a morphine fix. Yeah. Just and like, Riddick is... Do a, we really need him? Yeah. We, we can take his shotgun. He's not useful for much. Yeah, he's a drug addict. He'll just slow us down. Mm -hmm. See, it'd be really easy to do, but he doesn't do it because he's not trying to get ahead for himself. It's no, he, in he, he informs her of the problem so that she can... <laughs> yeah, he doesn't talk down to them or treat them like shit ever. He just antagonizes them because he doesn't really know how else to interact with people. Yeah. And that sort of gives him joy. Um, But, you know, it's interesting it because you know he won't do it. And when he asserts that violence, it's, be, it's the same thing. You know he's not going to do it now because that's why he got rid of John's. And the inverse of that is true too. We know Riddick is different than John's and we know he's our protagonist because he didn't do what John's did. Yeah. And what John's would do is exactly what Riddick is saying right now. So it's almost like it's a dramatic question that the movie has already answered. At the same time, I understand if you're trying to give Riddick and her the arcs that they have in this movie, why the scene is there. It's just like there needs to be a little bit of a shift in emphasis, I think, where it's like, okay, whose scene is it? Is it his scene or her scene? Yeah. Because she's the one that's like, yes, I would die for them. Which is it's like, oh, it's her scene. Yeah, it's technically the conclusion to her arc where she was willing to let everybody die for her. Which is a, a, it's like, oh, okay. But it also, in the way it's shot and everything, feels a little bit more like it's channeled through Riddick in a way that feels kind of like a first draft. <laughs> right? You can get the idea. It's in there somewhere. It's just not as clear as you think it might ought to be. I guess that's the other reason why I kind of like, I don't know, I appreciate certain things about this movie and think it's totally okay because it's like, there are ideas in there. They just, it's a, it's a little bit rough around the edges, you know? The other thing too, just oh, about having a breakdancing competition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They got the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the boom box with all the public enemy cassettes. But no, I, uh, the other interesting thing about that too, is just the way Vin Diesel himself as a performer informs, all of that, where it's like, again, the thing that's interesting about Vin Diesel is that he's that hard body 80s action hero, only for some reason he seems totally like unassuming. Yeah. 
he seems like the type of person who would like always cup a spider in a tissue to bring it outside. Well, that's the thing. Like I honestly like thought Vin Diesel was a wrestler for the longest time just because yeah. he kind of gives off that vibe of just like, and the name, which is interestingly, he got it from being a bouncer. Yeah. But like a bouncer kind of fits that too. Or yeah, like, it is. If you're similar. not the worst bouncer, like you're going to try to be friendly with people who aren't causing shit in the club. But also you do have to have a certain type of presence you're yeah. probably aware of, right? You have to be intimidating, but you have to like not like <laughs> just be an asshole to every single person. No, yeah. yeah. It makes it seem definitely seems like that type of job. At, at least the bouncers that, that I've respected at clubs I've been to have been ones that like I'm I'm gonna let you know not to fuck with me, but if you're nice and having a good time with regulars, then I'll talk to you and make a joke and laugh. Yeah. And I can, I can see that, but like maybe that's why he kind of doesn't have that. Cause the rock was a wrestler, obviously, but, but the rock also doesn't really play like a character in a lot of movies, at least that I can remember where they're trying to sell it as a moral question. <laughs> oh, here's the moment of the movie. The best shoulder shrug ever. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, David, everybody, not his best performance, but that, that moment is quite, no, quite amazing. We're here. We're basically he shoulder shrugs as a way of trying to ask, Hey, do you want to just leave Riddick behind <laughs> is the funny thing. He gives this half hearted shoulder shrug <laughs> to be like, come should on, we go? Come on, man. We- it's like, you're saying to have that person die. Right. He's yeah. like, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> but no. And it's a sign of life and humor in this movie. <laughs> and the fucking very drab ending of it. I think it's fine. I think it's I mean, fine. This, it's better lit than the beginning part of it. Like the blue bioluminescent light against the darkness. It, it, it like does provide interesting. What? what? You hated that earlier. What? No, like the blue like. Oh, you mean of the night. Part of the night. Yeah. Time sequences. Okay. No, not like the fucking blue washed out entire frame. I'm saying like the blue bioluminescent light casting that blue light over the darkness and like the regularly lit other parts provides a cool effect and I like yeah, it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I'm not saying I hate the color blue in general. Fuck that. Never light your movie in blue. Oh, now she's dead. No, oh, darn it. Fuck. The one character that had traits and a personality and something to them. Can't have them outshining Riddick. But again, also, it's it's a weird moment, too, because I understand in a certain sense why you give that. I just feel like it's oddly placed or you could have done it better. Um, and it's not easy to really get a good character to that moment, obviously, but it feels like a little bit of a missed opportunity because of that. And also him screaming not for me, like, again, it sort just, of implies that, like, he was going to, like try to do something super dangerous to like jump off a cliff and like tackle the thing, try and save her. But like, no, no, I I think it's more just that he's like, you shouldn't have sacrificed yourself for me. He doesn't want to be drawn back into society because he's like, how dare you make me feel feelings again? Yeah. But also like, that's what's necessary for him to complete his arc. So uh, it's just, it's multiple impulses that could be very good on their own or done together in a different way that are combined in a way that doesn't quite work, but gets certain things kind of right. So it doesn't feel like a failure. It just feels a little bit awkward. But the other interesting thing too, is like we, we end up with the situation where uh, she kind of is like that good, good woman from the Western, right? Yeah. Bringing him back into society in a specific way. I know there's still good in you yet. But also she does so by being a more proactive character in some ways, which is interesting too. And also she is the one getting, doing the work in labor in the wilderness in many ways, uh, just as much as he is, even though he's the one doing it more conspicuously, being a pack mule for like the cells or whatever. Oh, I guess the other thing I really wanted to mention about the way this movie treats that archetype too is it's sort of like a twist or inversion on what Warshaw says where he talks about how the violence is um, subordinate to like a moral impulse in the Western hero. 
Whereas in this, it's it's almost it's almost like an inverse of it because it's like it's not about when Riddick is violent; it's about how often he's not violent when he could be. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that also relates to him being like an embodiment of that sort of super predator convict inmate myth from the nineties is like, and yeah. no, his moral code is exemplified in how much he is not a horrible, violent monster. <laughs> but also Riddick died somewhere on that planet. I'm a new man now, except for the next movie who are in the same fucking character. I think it's more just that there's a world elsewhere maybe. And there's, you can look to the future cause now perhaps faith has been restored. Fuck you, David Tui. No, it's, there are far worse movies. There are, but I don't, still don't like this one. And the Wheat Brothers. Yeah. Ken Jim Wheat. It's, I don't know. I think, I think we've said as much as can be said about this movie. Yeah. Pitch Black. And uh, if somebody has something more to say, I'm kind of like not interested in hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> so. That's not what I, I was expecting you to be like, oh, I'd love to hear your, but now fuck you. I don't want to hear your, I don't know. I have more important things. Yeah. I don't really care. I have a casserole to make. <laughs> Compared, Vin Diesel has a casserole to make. Yeah, probably. Yeah, and he's like, pitch black for, sorry, casserole time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so I guess this has been pitch black. On the Spectator Film Podcast. We didn't sing Back in Black at all. So You're we, welcome. We were able to do you that owe successfully. Us one. Um, but yeah, if you want to listen to us do more movies than either of one of us really wanted to watch, much like World War One, no one knows how it got happened. And uh, no one really wanted to be there. But it was probably Austria's fault, just like this movie. <laughs> <laughs> Those fucking Austrians. Uh, anyway, <laughs> this has been the Spectator Film Podcast. You can find more episodes on spectatorfilmpodcast.com or on Spotify, iTunes, or Stitcher. And uh, yeah, I guess you did not know who you were fucking with, right, Max? I was going to say, I need to leave. Yeah, I'll leave, and I don't care if I want to say goodnight. Bye everyone. We'll do a more entertaining movie next week, I promise. I want you to think about how this could have gone. <laughs> but didn't. <laughs>